five minutes. Um, just so you can plan your time accordingly and we will wrap up. Yeah, we'll stick around for questions at the end if you want, or Jade will be done her presentation in about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And if you do have any burning questions about teaching outdoors with climate and sustainability, um, please feel free to pop them in the chat. We can do a Q&A at the end, or I can try and answer them as I, as I go through. Awesome, so welcome. Um, I know some of you, and I don't know some of you. I'm Leah Jeff. I'm the general manager of Sask Outdoors. And we are pleased to be partnering with the Outdoor Learning Store and Jade uh, for this presentation this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to do a little bio on Jade and then she's going to take it away with the presentation and tell us more about the Outdoor Learning Store. So Jade has a vivaciousness for life that ignites everyone around her. Uh, she uses this seemingly and unending energy to enrich the lives of youth through field trips, rock climbing, mountain biking, and outdoor youth skills camps, weaving in outdoor education and science as she goes. You'll definitely see this in the pictures. I got a sneak peek of the slides and she's got some beautiful pictures of all of her pursuits. On top of all this amazing work, she co-hosts Earthly Chats podcast and writes for scientific and education publications. Growing the outdoor education community, providing support networks for teachers and educators, and making sure youth have access to their natural environment is Jade's top priority. So welcome Jade and I'll let you take it from here. Hello, uh, that was a lovely intro, thank you. Um, it's always uncomfortable when people um, say these nice things, um, but thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm just gonna share my uh, screen with you. And welcome everybody to Tools and Resources uh, for Teaching Outdoors. Uh, this is a series and we're hoping to touch on various different themes that connect with people. Um, but this is all about climate and sustainability. So uh, this is me um, teaching in the Slocan Valley. I live in the interior of BC. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, but I spend a lot of my time in valley bottoms. Uh, and then surrounded uh, by big mountains. Um, so a lot of what I do with students is place-based education that's like sort of relevant to where you are. And, and I recommend doing that wherever you are teaching. Um, it's much easier for students, I think, to connect with um, clear-cut logging in their environment than it is with the destruction of the Amazonian rainforest. While it's relevant, like these sort of scales uh, move us up. But I, I've been teaching for 15 years. Uh, I'm originally from the UK, uh, but I've lived in the Arctic, in Norway, in France, in Australia, in New Zealand for several years, um, and now Canada for the last seven years. And so uh, I'm very honoured to call this place home. Um, so I've kind of seen a little bit about the way that we teach outdoors uh, across a couple of different spots. Um, so I'm up here uh, very at the very top of this page uh, in Revelstoke, BC, uh, which for the Sinaiq uh, First Nations people is the land of the bull trout, and for the Tanaha people uh, is the land of the Miskakis or the Chickadee. And they call the Columbia River the Chickadee River because we have so many of them around here. Um, it's also important for me to acknowledge that two other First Nations have utilised this uh, land uh, for many thousands of years. Uh, so that's the Okanagan Silks and the Shishwemuk people, or Shishwap. And uh, it is a place of, of great spiritual and environmental importance. And everything that I do with sustainability now is linked um, back into uh, traditional ecological knowledge. And it's really only in the last 10 years that the research of, of you know, Western science has started to connect with this traditional ecological knowledge. And I think that is so integral uh, to any work we do with climate and the land going forward um, is to, to, to do that two-eyed seeing and to connect uh, back to these. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as I go through. Um, so like this, this is my background. I don't know if anybody knows what they are. Um, if you want, you can have a stab in the, in the chat. I always do a bit of a competition with some of my older grade students to go and figure out what these are. 
Um, but this, this is what I, I research. Um, so I'm a paleoclimatologist by trade. Uh, so I reconstruct past environments and these are Ostracoda. They are microscopic bivalve crustaceans that are utilized as a climate proxy. Uh, and they live in every water, soil, um, environment on earth from a puddle to the deepest oceans. Uh, and they have these, this is with a scanning electron microscope, right? So these are like, you know, microscopic. Each of these um, is probably maximum half a millimeter. And they have these incredible decorations um, that are called nodes that um, occur due to their different environments. So the more nodey ones with all the bumps and stuff live in really saline water. And they basically live in really strict ecological bands so we can use them to build a stratigraphy of time. And so as you can see, this is like trying to make this interesting for students, it's quite hard. Um, and <laughs> they're like, yeah, whatever weirdo, I don't care about your micro bugs, um, particularly the older ones. So, you know, a big passion of mine, my first like degree was geography was, is the communication of science. And if we're talking about climate, so much of what mainstream media does is dumb the science down. And that just leaves a massive gap for the naysayers to sneak in with, oh, well, that's all nonsense. And what I'm trying to do, or what I think is important is, especially with older students and, and like, you know, middle school up, you start to introduce some real science. So when their parents come at them with a, I don't believe that, or, you know, peers or social media posts, they can say, hang on a minute. Um, and so that's, that's my big goal is um, sort of making all this boring stuff quite interesting for them. So. Well, we'll see. Um, you know, it's got to start young though. So here I am always wearing the same orange sweater, um, but this is down by the Columbia River. This is a grade like two, three class. And we are out um, talking about our changing climate. So I'm all about no doom and gloom before grade four. But what I did with these guys is we went down onto the beach that so you can sort of see hidden behind there and did something as simple um, as building animal shelters. So I talk about extreme weather. And so I got them to build shelters um, for a mouse, which, or small animal, which was a rock that they'd found that was no bigger than their fist. And then I got them to build the most strong uh, structure that they could. And then I came in with like a big board of wind and, and poured water on it with a watering can. And you know, this does work better if you uh, have uh, access to lots of water or, you know, can carry or wagon uh, some big water bottles. Um, but really, they were just so impressed at like whether their structure had stood up to it. And I said, basically, that's what we've got to do is we've got to build things strong, because the weather might get a bit more intense. And so um, you can even start introducing these ideas uh, pretty young. And that's been pretty successful for me. Um, here I am as the seasonal fairy. Um, if we take it real back, so you can either do, you know, with early childhood or these are my kindergarten grade ones um, this is our tree this uh, big beautiful aged birch in the background and I come in four times a year and we track our tree and the nature around it um, through the seasons I'm the spring sprite I believe here with all the colors and the flowers in my hair um, but a big thing uh, with this age is just if we know it we protect it. If we start to look at the trees, look at the environments, changes to the forest floor in the canopy, uh, what secondary plants do we see? Are they providing shelter? Do we see tracks? Do we see life, other life? Do we see lichen? What does lichen mean? What is lichen made up of? You know, this symbiotic relationship between algae and, and fungi. Like all of these things can be taught very early on and it all ties in to an understanding of our climate because these are these sort of bios, right? These, these bio geo climatic zones that are very specific to a place. And so that's um, what I start with. Um, and they start to sort of track. And when we talk about climate, it's such a big scale temporal thing. If we start with weather, that's where you get them. If they can start to understand what weather does, uh, then they can start to understand climate as they go through. Um, some of the other stuff, so I'm a, an ACMG 
climb an instructor and, and do some out really outdoorsy stuff um you don't have to take a bunch of teenagers to the top of a glacier and actually the summit of this is out of picture it's really quite high and uh, quite intense we went for a three-day camp um they were about 4k into an 18k hike uh, to the campground and we're all like are we there yet like, oh dear this is not going to go well but actually they summited it um, but one of the greatest things is if you can get access to a glacier, this is the ever receding Begbie Glacier, uh, this little patch of snow up here. Um, these kinds of opportunities uh, really connect with them. Uh, and then you can start doing, start outside and then go in and start looking at mapping. There's some amazing uh, glaciological records uh, that look at glacier size um, in our near history. Um, you can start to plot changes. You can start to talk about um, ablation or melt uh, and what causes that. And then it's really irrelevant delving even deeper into what's causing the climate change because it's happening. And then they can start to really look at, at just action and adaptation as opposed to the who said, she said, they said, what's going on. It's more like, okay, these, these are shrinking. What is the impact of that? When we lose, um, glacier ice we lose albedo right the ability the reflective properties of ice that sends 99 percent of the sun's energy back out if it melts by 10 percent there's a very simple awesome bit of math that you can do about how much more of the sun's rays coming and how fast you're going to accelerate the melt okay so i like there's just so many different levels uh, the other thing is, um, yeah, I've spent a bit of time in dangerous locations and situations, and we're on a training course here with uh, Search and Rescue, so uh, we were doing a bunch of rope stuff, um, but you don't have to be up here on the scary rock face with all the ropes, you could be right down here, this is actually in Banff um, National Park, you could be right down here on the forest floor, um, but really taking kids outside, um, there's a lot of protocols now for risk um, that really involve letting them go out there, explain some rules and regulations, but you don't have to be having a crazy wild experience with equipment in order for it to feel wild. And I think getting students outside into a wild space um, can really give them the opportunity to switch off from the eco anxiety attached to climate and sustainability that we're seeing a lot of or I'm seeing a lot of I'm not sure if you are too but um you know being out there and actually still seeing that there's beautiful whether that's a prairie or whether that's a mountain top or whatever uh, I think that that's a really important part of what we're doing as well is just the joy of being outside and not to overthink it too much I mean, converging evidence strongly suggests that experiences of nature boost academic learning, personal development and environmental stewardship. I mean, we've known it forever, but the research is, is there now. Um, and so if you have reluctant parents or, um, you know, school leaders or anything like that, um, you know, we and um, our buddies that take me outside have a whole just sort of section of peer reviewed journal papers that you can utilize to share the value of what you're doing taking this learning outside. Um, outdoor learning is not equitable. Um, there are lots of people that are not living in mountainous environments like I didn't grow up in one of those I grew up in a very urban landscape. Um, and something as simple as a silk tarp with these kids um, where we're talking about the subnivian zone here. Uh, this can be on a playground, a field, um, could be out, you know, in the wilderness, but uh, we're talking about, yeah, how animals use the insulative uh, properties of snow to hide and live under there in the winter. Again, weather equals climate, just over a long time. Um, so yes, some of this stuff um, hopefully will, will resonate with you, even if you're not having to or able to access these big outdoor landscapes um, you can do stuff in your schoolyard and still just have as much impact um okay oh fridays for future right so seven thousand cities 14 million people have joined in with these climate rallies these are students from revelstoke it's a bit of a grainy picture it was taken from our local paper um but here they are protesting and i think this is the biggest thing is that students care 
is that young people care about our planet and they are willing to step up and have a voice. And so any activities um, that are action based that give them an opportunity to speak up, practice letter writing uh, to your local council or politicians, uh, sign making to go and speak, have them record um, do research and then record short videos, post it on a school social media, post it to policymakers, show them that you care. Like there's lots of things that you can do uh, in terms of giving youth a voice and communicating. Uh, and then science um, based stuff is really important to me. So we are, I'm here with a grade 11, 12 uh, science class. And here we have uh, all the different greenhouse gases on their pages. Uh, and we are sorting them, we made them move around um, into uh, first by abundance and then by uh, greenhouse gas warming potential, right? And their idea of what was the worst, because everyone hears about carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, you know, it was interesting to have them um, start to communicate about some of the other things um, like, you know, methane. Um, and then where does that methane come from? And then we can start talking uh, about, um, and you can go and research. You can look into your governmental list of where your emissions are coming from. There's a full project in there straight away. Uh, and we did this all outside. They really enjoyed um, the fact, I mean, we were learning outside, you know, almost as I would never, I had never taught this particular part outside before. I'd always done it in a classroom. And amazing, you know, laminated bits of paper and I will use them forever and I will never teach this inside again. The second part of this trip was modeling uh, biodiversity. So we went and um, we built simple quadrats, like a square meter square. And then we went into a managed forest and a natural forest and we looked at biodiversity. And what's interesting is that we in the managed forest, we were in a sort of um, three year old clear cut. The biodiversity was actually higher uh, because, you know, you make clear and then nature starts to fill in all the gaps with different things. So we had some amazing discussions about, ah, but are these the species that we want? And then what does industry do to these species if this, you know, was not a managed forest where they would have had these plots that were natural? Uh, would they wipe it out with sort of pesticides or um, so with weed killer. So there's some amazing things talking about the value of trees uh, economically, but also environmentally for carbon storage, debunking myths about new trees storing more carbon than old. Uh, there's so many different ways that we can go down these routes. Um, and these students were really, really engaged in doing their own research. The other thing we did is I gave them a bunch of uh, articles. Some were peer reviewed journals, some were uh, magazine articles, some were some social media posts all about climate. Uh, and I asked them to summarize and then give it back to me and they did. Uh, and then I said, okay, but who wrote it? And they were like, oh, I don't know, I have to look. Nobody, you didn't ask us that. And I said, okay, um, yeah, find out. And you know, just a, a reporter wrote this or someone from an environmental law association uh, some from a, a very uh, right-wing newspaper or uh, that has a lot of investment in oil and gas and I asked them to critically discuss what potential agenda the people that had written this information had and it hadn't really occurred to them and I think one of the biggest things again with climate and older students is access to this you know anything with a phone or an iPad and an internet connection is that there is a huge dissemination of, of bad information. So, so much, and I didn't learn to critically discuss until I went to university. I want these, these young people to have it earlier. Make me an argument, tell me what the, the bias is here. And that took up two whole sessions and they got so deep into it of realizing um, that, that there are, are people with opinions that they are filtering in and they hadn't ever thought about it prior to that or so they said so uh, yeah get people to to assess information there's some really specific tools and resources so obviously I work uh, with the outdoor learning store and uh, what we do is provide tools and resources um oh I was going to ask people hang on let me can I 
launch a poll if anyone's got the ability to click on. I'm going to ask, where are you joining us? Oh, no, not where are we joining us from? The question is, who are you? Um, are you early childhood? Are you K to six, seven to 12? Are you an informal educator? Just someone homeschooling, something else? Just so I can get an idea of what you need. Oh, nice. Everybody. We've got a bit of everything. That's great. OK, I'll keep going. Thank you so much. Um, just so you can see, we've got a little bit of everything there. Um, yes, yeah, so the idea is that um, resources, you know, create equity. Um, so if we're talking K to six or maybe some of the recreational things, the best way that I connect with my kids is to inspire wonder and affection for the natural landscape. Yes, they're not going to understand the complexity of orbital forcing mechanisms that are the way that we move around the sun controlling our climate on thousand year cycles, but um, they can totally be like, this plant is awesome and it grows in this season. Um, Remy Rodin's albums, Think About the Wild, um, you can get a physical CD copy. They're also available on Spotify. Um, beautiful songs. Um, What's that habitat talks about food, water, shelter, space, the things you need. They've got actions. Let's get drastic with our plastic, thinking about sustainability. Um, I could go on. There's so many. And if you start your day with a song like that, um, not only are they engaged, um, they're excited, uh, even though the message is quite real. Um, Natural Curiosity is a resource uh, that talks about Indigenous perspectives and it's all inquiry based. So what I love about this is you go out with a question and you start to just figure things out. What lives in this soil? OK, well, how do I go about that? Do I take a sample? Um, do we put that sample in a jar? Do we watch it over time? Um, and so I can only really um, say that there are just so many beautiful, you can just follow the whole the whole book through there it's it's more pedagogical uh, the school garden curriculum is not just about uh growing a school garden it's about ecology science maths it all connects across so many um very topics and yes Part of it is growing a garden, uh, but it's looking at seasonality. It's looking about food security and its relation to climate where you live. In the pandemic, everyone started to think about uh, climate where I was for a second and food security when the trucks, when there were no drivers and we realized how far our food travels for us. And then of course the grocery stores restocked eventually and everyone forgot about it again. But these are things that um, we can connect early on um books like uh Sheila and the White, uh, land is more like a storybook that you can read but it's written by female indigenous authors it is um illustrated by a female indigenous author uh, and it connects four different nations um first nations uh, in indigenous perspectives through the land and there's some moralistic tales about um healthy harvesting and protecting water and protecting biodiversity so books like that can go a really long way i read stories all the time any age group even adults i, I read a story or a poem um, when i get into the outdoor space to ground us and connect us to that environment um, and this can be really a beautiful way to get in there um, the books on the left here a group of books uh, from Strong Nations, which is an indigenous owned publishing house. Uh, they're based on Vancouver Island and they've got strong stories for lots of different First Nations that have uh, that are relative to really specific um, activities uh, that are important to that group or um, that follow seasonality. There's so and so in winter, in fall, uh, and that can be a really beautiful way to introduce. The big book of nature activities is magic. Not only does it, uh, it, it covers North America as a whole, and there's all different areas depending on your sort of um, sort of biome that you live in. It follows seasonality and it's all games based. You know, I, I love this. We play the, the uh, butterf monarch butterfly migration game. So one end of the field is 
uh, we start in, in Canada and then they have to get to Mexico uh, down the other end and they have to pick up sticks for food um, and then it's sort of I don't know if you know night at the museum but I'm facing away and if I turn around then they have to freeze because they have to go and camouflage to stay still um, and then I make it more difficult in following rounds I hide bits of food uh, we put a pond with a hula hoop where they have to drink at least once on their way um, there's so many different sort of practical games and that's the thing is we're not sitting down writing we're playing silly games that make everyone happy um early childhood as well um i've got a couple of david sobel's books that aren't on here that are about nature-based uh early childhood and um we're doing releasing one next month actually about map making which can be so incredible you don't think about climate and sustainability and map making but giving them a sense of space and of what is around them can help them map change over time. And that's how we understand sustainability, what has changed over time here. So really amazing ways to get them. And the walking curriculum by Gillian Judson, which is paragraph uh, bite-sized bits of information um, of, of, you know, we're gonna go on a cracks walk and you start to look for cracks and this works really well in an urban environment. And then you start, do we find anything growing in the cracks? And what materials are used and how will this change over time? And then you can introduce the concepts of weathering and all sorts. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities there for, for lots of fun ideas. Um, at this age group, some practical equipment that you can do is looking at stuff, get them to, hold and I mean the pine cone is quite a boring example normally we get something live in there um but we have some amazing um discovery guides that are laminated and kid proof uh, of any age um of birds of um for each region in Canada um bugs and slugs I've got plant knowledge cards that they can go and do a scavenger hunt for or find that plant in the landscape. Uh, I've got an Indigenous book here for the Tanaha um, for translation. So if you can connect to that space, I've got some uh, Saskatchewan more focused uh, coming up. Give a kid a clipboard and a scavenger hunt and let them go and find uh, evidence of heat or evidence of water, even if we're trying to focus it down that climate. Find me something that has been alive for a long time. Get them thinking about spatial temporal scales. Dip nets, nothing more joyful than watching kids capture macroinvertebrates and then looking up uh, those bugs that tell you all this information about whether the environment's healthy or not. Look at birds get them to be still for a moment so we can look and listen for birds and that stillness and that connection to nature is going to be the impetus for the next generation of, of environmental stewards. Everybody loves a sit pad. Dry butts, happy kids, adults. I um, just completed a avalanche operations course where I had to dig snow pits two meters deep and I spent a lot of time kneeling uh, on my sit pad and it was glorious. They're also quite good in a first aid situation if you need to keep someone off the snow. Oh, I just wanna show you this. So this is one of my classes. I'm gonna mute it because it's not really got any audio. Um, these are uh, sort of waste-free gifts for Christmas. Ski pass, a music gift card, wine store gift card a ski lesson, a skating pass, a gift card for gaming, a tour, a ticket to go to an art gallery or a glass blowing thing. I mean, you have to have a glass blowing where you are. Uh, escape room, just gift cards, right? So we're looking, um, even with these younger students, food, they give the gift of food. I like that a lot. Um, of connecting kids with the understanding of, so now we move from climate into sustainability, okay? What are the impacts of Christmas? You can very easily look up at how many tons of, of waste we produce in that time. You can also do it midwinter for Valentine's Day, thinking about all the wrappers. Uh, you can get them involved in understanding 
how big a ball of, of um, aluminum foil off of chocolates needs to be for it not to fall down the cracks uh, in the recycling plant. Um, so you really need um, them to be uh, sort of egg sized or bigger. So doing a collection of, of wrappers around Easter or whatever, so you can collect all the metal when it will actually get recycled rather than going in the garbage. Um, yeah, waste free gifts are a really good way to get kids thinking about sustainability without it being uh, sort of stressful for them, like you're damaging the planet. Um, as they get older, they can start to, to go a bit deeper. If you are looking to build any kind of curriculum uh, or, you know, you're homeschooling or you've got a recreation group that you're trying to focus, Gillian Judson's Engaging Imagination in Ecological Education uh it's the first time i've actually managed to do that without spitting everywhere is uh, an amazing uh, resource and it basically talks about the fact that the way we learn is through um creating uh, stories and connections to things emotionally and so you need imagination for that what we want is the next generation of imaginative problem solvers and this helps us uh groundswell is an amazing book uh indigenous written um that talks about a call to action and i think this is the biggest thing that we get with the older kids is is taking action super important uh connecting the dots has got some um beautiful sort of inquiry based step by step ideas about what older students can do for projects uh, and a people's curriculum for the earth does things like um teaches you it's got all these beautiful sort of examples and kids become an indigenous group uh, at a climate action summit and they have to argue their point and they start to get into this sort of communication debate which i think is really important books like the heart of a river that talk about the way that we uh, have changed Natural systems for energy production with hydroelectric dams is a good way, soft way, to talk about uh, the way that we've changed our landscape in a short period of time um, and how sustainable or not that is. Uh, green teachers books teaching kids and teaching teams about climate change are very practical so the kids stuff has got like uh, the carbon dioxide game it's basically just a circle game where kids run from the outside in to touch an inner circle which is chalked um, and they're the sunbeams coming in hitting the earth and escaping and then you put clouds of other students in the way and maybe they get tagged and they end up staying and it's a really amazing sort of visual representation of how greenhouse gases or specifically carbon uh, multiply in the atmosphere and get retained and then again um not okay. Oh, sorry, uh, Not Extinct um, is uh, specific for me in living in the valley uh, with the Sinaites people, um, but these beautiful allegorical tales that speak to caring for the environment and sustainable and how the environment is alive, how, you know, plants are people, animals are people, uh, and they are all valuable. And I think if you can instill any level of uh, care and affection, uh, then we'll create the stewards of the next generation. If you're in Saskatchewan, and this is the Sask Outdoors, we've got a couple of new books that are coming in the Métis bundle here, Medicines to Help Us. So this beautiful book, um, it's traditional knowledge, there's language in there. Um, but the reality is, is that our ecosystems have evolved and adapted for billions of years. And I do a game with a piano timeline of climate um, where I've I, if we're indoors, I have put it up on a board and, you know, the left hand side, look as left of the piano is the beginning of time and, and the right hand side is now. And I go for a PowerPoint and little sort of arrows pop up um, and it's like, OK, so what's alive? What was alive at this point in the piano time game? And for half of the entire history, half of that piano, um, it was nothing. And then there was just single celled bacteria and they're all like dinosaurs and, you know, monkeys. And it's just bacteria. And then you see that if you look at humans and our occupation, we are one millimeter on the furthest piano key up the end. Uh, and look at how it's changed and i've got you know there's beautiful pictures there's beautiful reconstructions online and i would be happy to share my slides if anyone's interested um to teach about landscape evolution and how much humans have impacted our landscape in a short period of time uh, and nobody understands this better than the indigenous people so utilizing their knowledge the other thing I have is a geological timescale walk. Um, it's very difficult, again, to grasp these large temporal scales. 
and I can send you the link and a follow up email um, to how you do this. It's basically a staged walk. Um, so each sort of period of Earth's geological history is broken down to how many steps. So you start off doing like 400 steps to get to bacteria. Uh, it, it's about a 5K hike. So you can do just a square around, um, you know, your school district, or you can go out into the forest and do it. Uh, and I give each kid, there's a card um, for each bit. And then, okay, take one step. And at the end, you're taking, you know, millimeter steps uh, for when the humans are there and talking about this sort of change. And if you can, yeah, connect with environmental change over the long term, they start to understand uh, how quickly things are, are happening. There's a couple more books, um, Relatives with Roots and The Giving Tree. Again, this might be younger kids and it really just ties into um, caring. When we care, we protect. And I think that's the hugest thing with sustainability and connecting into indigenous perspectives where we see uh, groups of people that have cared and um, have had you know generational intergenerational thinking about um looking after our environment uh, rather than what we're doing which is very much in the now um okay uh, older students again although this works with all all age groups get them outside turn them into scientists there's nothing more empowering uh, than, than doing real science. This is the massive kit, but we've got these tiny ones that are just like a thermometer and a pH um, reader and, and get kids testing water. Then get them to submit it. There's Living Lakes Canada. There's um, different provincial organizations that will take your data and publish it. And so I can highly recommend. And when we talk about water, we talk about the hydrological cycle and we talk about the fact that that lake you swim in or the water coming out of your tap was once stepped in puddles by dinosaurs 66 million years ago. And their minds are like, balloon. you know, it's a way to connect them in with that. And some of these like dissolved oxygen, which is this sort of blue, um, thing in the middle you don't have to be a scientist to understand it there's a beautiful little manual in there in all of the kits that just uh, breaks it down step by step um take them out when it's dark especially in the winter if you're not sure you know, or you know it's dark very early go out after school uh, and look at the night sky you can talk about light pollution you can talk about noise pollution uh, and I will again, I'll link to an app, it's called Stellarium, it's free, it is the most incredible uh, sky observation app, um, where you can set it up for exactly where you're looking, it shows you exactly the night sky that would be in front of you, even if it's cloudy, and you can get kids thinking about constellations, there's links to the um, indigenous stories as well, and it's beautiful, again, just get out there. Uh, these are my grade nines, two classes, massive groups uh, looking uh, at water quality. We were testing this pit. Interestingly enough, when we got there, the city had turned up. Um, they had dug this um, pond out um, to increase its ability for um, fish spawning. Um, and what they thought would be a great idea is to completely clear the bank of vegetation, like where all these students are standing, uh, and sort of put this hard broken rock in there, and to dig this pond and just off screen right is a culvert that runs down from, it's the drainage of our ski hill, where the water flows out. Uh, and they were there um, digging out the culvert again because they hadn't dug the angle of the slope steep enough so all of the small fine sediment is just fills up the culvert again and again and again and it is now not in any way shape or form a better fish spawning site than it was a year ago where it was natural and overgrown and, and shady and stuff and so another wonderful expression for these students about how when humans intervene we often do a terrible job um, but we did, we looked at what native species we had, and then we can talk about native pollinators and we can talk about two thirds of all of our food coming from them. And the fact that native pollinator species don't work with invasive plants. And so we will lose our biosecurity that way. Uh, you can take it on, on many different levels. Uh, what we also did as a part of this, it's not a great picture, so I took it that side of the roads 
actually you can sort of see it here um, my students we went on a tour of a watershed that's my friend and my dog um, we went on a tour and they um, talked to us about the bylaws to do with water so students made posters this is a really busy stop sign intersection they made these posters and the city were really happy for, to put them up so it's like this little sort of uh, student action project where they got to not only learn about uh, what best practice was, um, they're then communicating that um, to their community and it, they really enjoyed that and they were like proud as punch when they went out there and uh, the mayor came out and it was all very exciting and it took about 10 minutes to get a yes because the city's like Ooh, supporting our kids um, so I would hope that that could be replicated. Um, Again, uh, this is like rock sorting. We went down to the beach. You can do this in a classroom if you collect enough stones, like 15 in a brown paper bag works. Um, but we were down at the river beach here and they found four sticks as long as their arm. And then I asked them to sort the rocks that were inside their square. And then we start, oh, how do we do this? The first round, it's normally size or shape or color. And then I asked them to repeat the rounds again and again, a minute each time. And then, you know, they run out of ideas and then we start to talk about texture and is this stripy rock the same as this stripy rock and we start to talk about geological history and landscape evolution again so it's tucking back into that climate of how our world works in these cyclical and interconnected cycles and the more that they can learn that those rocks are connected to them and to the animals that live and have traveled on this huge journey down from the mountains and will make the soil that grow the plants that give us oxygen uh it's sort of yeah you can take that inquiry down uh, some fun roads the other thing we did here was uh after talking about responsible harvesting practices big old glass jars one group collected sand one collected mud one collected moss and we made mini ecosystems and in order actually to compete to be able to add to their uh, ecosystem jar they had to answer a question a scientific question or a question that we'd done on our field trip uh, this is just some baking sheet and um, uh, empty milk carton lid uh, filled up with water and I like to um, I go to my thrift store and get little plastic animals and so this is the um, you know Bengal tiger tiger and his natural habitat in Revelstoke BC um, but the little kids love it and actually, you can do this with older students, uh, making it more complex and more layered, and then ask them to collect data if they see any insects come out of the soil. Often you'll see sort of nematodes or worms coming out later on. Uh, and these should be self-sufficient on a windowsill. Like these are still alive two years later and, and really good ones if you sealed it properly and occasionally opened it to put more water in uh, can go for, you know, decades. I think that's me most of the time. I realised that I um, I speak more about climate because that's that's my thing. Uh, but sustainability, um, if you're not comfortable taking a bunch of kit out uh, to do water testing, just take your students for a creek, creek cleanup, you know, some washing up gloves donated from families, uh, go and take some garbage out and, and talk about human impact that way. Um, you can go... Uh, into a shoreline or even at the edge of a field going into a forest or the edge of your field going into a road and talk about plant succession. Um, what happens from the grass? Do we then start to see other plants coming in? You know, doing a simple biodiversity transect to understand how much life is actually on what looks like a quite barren piece of grass uh, can be really powerful. And I think that's it for my presentation for the moment, yes. <laughs> If you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free. You can unmute or write it in the chat or anything like that. Maybe you could type in the chat um, why you came, like what was it that you were hoping? And I can wonder if I've, I've touched on that or if there was anything that you uh, were looking for. Uh, out of this workshop and I can attempt to um, connect you with any ideas there. 
Uh, but yes, I do thank you uh, for your time and for listening. And yeah, a lot of these practical activities uh, or equipment and resources um, are available at the Outdoor Learning Store. We are completely non-profit social enterprise so it all just goes back into providing free workshops and uh, supporting kids outside um okay wanted to learn the best ways to impact kids for my school program yeah um place-based connect them with what's going on around them I even had another project where we have a no idling bylaw in our city but it's not enforced or uh respected and so we spoke to the city council and the kids uh, did a, a poster competition uh, and it had to have like the city's info on it. And so they gave us a template and then the kids designed and it's just about to go in where they're choosing it. And then we're going to put those posters up in high idle areas around grocery stores and on the main street. And so kids really enjoyed taking action that way and, and connecting. I would love to host a workshop specifically for N and K teachers. What's N? You have to let me know. Activities to use in environmental science, grade 11, to get your students outside. Yeah. Biodiversity transects. Um, building your own small weather station. Very simple weather gauges you can do for rain collection and then they can start plotting on graphs if you do have snow uh, you can look into building snow pits and looking at temperature gradients where you measure every 10 centimeters down and looking at how uh, the insulative properties of snow stargazing app is called stellarium i'll send the link in your follow-up email land place-based education decolonizing western curriculum yeah get involved some of the indigenous resources we have a whole section on the website that can guide you we also do just have some free connection to indigenous resources um there's so much being published and there's just so much momentum with elevating indigenous voices which just fills me with joy uh, and actually if you go to outdoorlearningstore.com slash workshops and scroll right to the bottom we hosted some workshops um with uh, indigenous authors um, that are pretty interesting. Also the podcast uh, that I record with Ian from Green Teacher Magazine um, is called Earthy Chats. And there we've got like Faye O'Neill talking about braiding indigenous wisdom into um, outdoor ed. And she's an indigenous educator for her school district this way. Um, yeah, Sask Outdoors has some awesome workshops coming up. Oh, the other thing you can do, team, to inspire um, is there is funding for this. So Sask Outdoors has a micro grant. Uh, they have two deadlines, March 15th and October 15th. You can get up to $500 um, to do a project at your school. Uh, Learning for a Sustainable Future has their action grants. It's still open, I believe. And an ongoing basis, again, $500. That's how we funded the uh, signage, um, bylaw signage that we're doing. Um, if you're in BC, there's Go Grants, which will do the same. They'll even give you a little bit more. Um, yes, uh, any other thoughts? Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff comes from, from the books. There's lots of activities that you can do to connect to your particular landscape. Are you investigating how many different types of grass you have and, and which of those grasses is more resilient to, to climate change and why? You know, really delving into that investigation um, and learning, learning the indigenous language of your, of your space. Um, I'm learning uh, Tanaha at the moment and so a big part of what I do with my students is to try and uh, add the indigenous names to wildlife and plants that we see and that really connects with sustainability of, of that importance. Um, yes there's some chats going, uh, links going in the chat there and I think perhaps you were going to finish Leah by just a couple of things talking about your uh, if you missed this part, we are recording. So again, I'm going to send a follow up email with a bunch of links to resources um, and yeah, some of that funding. And then, yeah, you can just uh, skip right to the uh, Yeah, you'll have a whole list and it will be there. And then if there's an interesting part, um, I'll also send that from my personal email address. So you, if you do 
uh, have questions or uh, are not quite sure, um, you know, I've supported um, some of my local science or geography teachers who perhaps um, have their specialty in other other areas um, as to how they can manage it. The one last thing I didn't say um, is that at any age, and actually if you were talking about olders, is journaling. Um, get a weatherproof notepad. Again, we have them in the store, but you can get them anywhere and get those kids to pay attention. Field sketching, especially um, for the older students, is an art. And get them to look low level, get them to look uh, down at that bottom part. If you've read Robin Moore Kimmerer's Gathering Moss, and she talks about the boundary layer and how uh, wind just stops down there, get kids to lie down be in the boundary layer if it's super windy uh, you can connect in that way um, with those students where we were looking at greenhouse gases we were sketching uh, all the different levels up into the canopy and they you know stopped taking their phones out of their pockets um, and if you can't stop that get them to take pictures there's an enormous amount of free id apps get them to partake in a bio blitz that um, is relevant to your area um, get them to take pictures of nature and go back and sketch them and produce a scientific uh, anatomical drawing from that picture and then look up why that species is that species native or invasive uh, what um, you know benefits does it have does it have any medicinal properties is it when was it introduced or if it's a historical plant right then you can start to connect this with social studies with history with the land with indigenous perspectives with science um and yes i think i think that's me i could literally just chat with you guys for hours so <laughs> just stop I was going to finish by a few things about Sask Outdoors. Some of you know about Sask Outdoors. Um, we're a professional growth network with the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation. So if you're a teacher and you are looking for a PGN to join this year or next year, I understand all the teachers get a, a free pass to a PGN. Um, so you can definitely look us up on the list when that time comes around again. And we, similar to what Jade's talking about, we just want to support educators, formal and informal and non-formal um, in getting people outside. Um, and we will are happy to support you and make connections in whatever way that we can for whatever needs that you have. I think I put in the chat most of the things I was going to mention, um, the podcast, the grants, the workshops. Uh, the only thing I didn't put in the chat is we do have an equipment lending library. So we are slowly adding things to our gear library that we lend out to our members. And so if they're I'll pop that in when I'm done talking, but if there's something that you're looking for to help you in an outdoor or environmental experience, you can let us know and we are constantly adding to our stash of gear. So we are always open to suggestions. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat too, if you want to connect with Sask Outdoors when we're done. But you're, so I guess this the end then. So if you want to stick around and chat, we are most happy to do that. Also, if you want to go like make supper or go home or whatever your situation life situation is you are also most welcome to do that mm. thank you for coming yes thank you so much thanks for having me leo um hello hello sorry you guys i was late um every time i go to one of these there's so much good information in the chat and then i don't know so like is the chat still there when you get the link to the recording because like all these links are I can put a link to the chat for sure. It automatically the chat always seems to like go away. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, the good stuff. Well, not all the good stuff. Lots of good stuff is in the chat. Anyway, <laughs> so sure. yeah. It, are you will you do that, Jade? That I can would be do so that great. absolutely. I'm gonna make like a note an so amazing don't forget. presentation yeah. that I missed most of. Uh yeah, I can and the text file with the chat is super simple and small to, to add onto okay. the bottom there and you're right sometimes the best discussions happen when people are oh this thing happens or I, I appreciate that but I will try and get all the relevant links in a really nice clickable format for you in the email so that you can um well, I'm a doing a land-based learning class right now I've got um not very many students because we were we didn't have it last year because of COVID mm -hmm. but anyway the little bit that I saw of your of your presentation, there was like this many, this many ideas that I can use 
Um, so uh, unfortunately, it was it's only seven weeks, and it's from it's just or January and February. We have a break in Saskatchewan in February, about the third week. So it was those seven weeks, and I was kind of discussed like not, I was disappointed that it was only seven weeks, and it was like the dead of winter. But as it turns out. There's a lot of amazing stuff. I really do enjoy the outdoors. So like, I mean, we've been snowshoeing, ice fishing, cross country skiing, but now we're going to build a village. And then this thing with the temperature and the dip, we've got so much snow in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan right now. It's, it's like almost a meter high on like a level. So amazing. it's, it's awesome. But anyways, yeah. So I can't wait to see the whole presentation. Yeah. And get, and another thing you can do, and you can do this like, all ages um but with older kids is amazing is um uh like build houses if you like get a slope and then get them to build like tunnels and then um empty pill bottle or clear plastic containers like they used to hold film canister yeah 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 um fill it with jello halfway up flagging tape and you get teams of kids to compete um to best insulate their uh their mouse and so they have to think about where that would be in the landscape. Um, and then you leave one. They on just the wait. The mouse is the canister. Exactly. Filled, filled with jello and the flagging tape is so you can find it. Again. So you can find it. And teams of students have to best uh, protect their, their piece of wildlife. Right. And have an understanding of how nature adapts um, to our changing climate. That is awesome. It's a fun yes. one. We can actually do that right out in our schoolyard because we, where they've plowed the, the, parking lot the snow is probably 10 feet high and exactly. so that would be super fun get these great pictures of them building these tunnels right and what happens if you build two rooms with a tunnel does the air like get trapped um the other thing you can do is pre-bake uh, baked potatoes um and wrap them in foil keep them warm in your oven and then put them in a a, a tub again wrapped in foil and then you give each um group and I lay out on the ground, I've got like an oven mitt, a sock, a toque, um, a piece of animal fur, if you can get it. Um, and you, they get, I normally do that. They have to compete to get first choice by answering a sciencey question. They get their choice. They wrap up their potato. They measure the temperature before uh, and then um, hide it for two hours where they think it would be best protected and in what it would be best protected and they measure the temperature afterwards and you can graph the change and relative um to what materials have the best insulative properties and why perhaps we should because i can tell you it works uh like indigenous people using fur is much more effective than um you know like a woven dishcloth well what i do have is i just have a pair of moccasins that'll work lovely and the potato is in foil um but yeah standard um you know cooking thermometer but i was also thinking home. about just some like pink insulation yes yeah so see see whether the modern world has 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 improved it mm, yeah and yeah talk about oh my god they're... oh my god i love yeah. this so much oh, okay good. awesome that's awesome now you got my juices flowing here yeah so. and, and we i call that the the hot potato term again because they burrow and do their things so that that can work and the kids love it because it's competitive as well they're out yeah. there like that's my pie i'm gonna hide it and you just have to make sure that other students don't steal it in the period bet between you hiding it and i also lost a potato once it was devastating but uh the kids were <laughs> so did you did you you only measure the temperature uh at the beginning and at the end or do you take a middle temperature you can totally do that too especially with with older students you could you could take a temperature every hour and then you can average out so you obviously want to make sure that each student knows the beginning and the end and, we're, we're, and then is it linear or exactly not? and you can measure start to plot that on a simple thing with time and temperature uh, and then and then they can do a comparative study uh, then you can even take it into literacy where they have to do a you know um document and and present why uh it is important that we have these materials available for us how can we make sure that we have these is there God, i hope i can remember this <laughs> uh, this well, is no, because is this going to be this part is recorded of the... so you can you can oh, take it on because oh, i'm getting um, old i can't remember everything anymore <laughs> and then um yes they can i i mean i have been doing a lot of stuff with kids of um them narrating they take pictures as they do these and then they i get them to record and narrate over it uh and they a public speaking none of these kids 
make eye contact and the narration is less scary than being filmed um but then they have to argue like okay but should that pink insulation be out in nature and you know what happens so there's there's all kinds of ways to sort of tangent but uh yes yeah terrific thank you okay. so much you're so welcome lovely to meet you jackie lovely to meet you too i hope that um i meet you again someday and i will definitely be looking at your website okay thank you so much Bye-bye. Thanks, Leah. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. This has been awesome. I don't know how to get out of All here. Right. In the uh, interest of everyone's screen time, and I'm into a board meeting pretty sharpish here. Um, thank you for having me, Leah. Thanks for coming. Have a lovely evening.